beginning, new beginning church and our online family and friends. We need the Lord to lead and guide us every day, all day. We want to thank you so much for joining us on tonight for Bible study. And we pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight is Proverbs 25 and 4. Proverbs 25 and 4, and it reads, Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. King Solomon, who wrote most of the book of Proverbs, was known for one thing above all others. The scripture says God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the sea shore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the East and the wise men of Egypt. When we trust God rather than simply relying on what makes sense to us, and when we honestly want to do God's will, God will indeed show us which path to take. Pastor Davis and I watched the news today, and it was one case after another. The unvaccinated people in the hospitals who contracted the virus wished they had gotten vaccinated. One story after another on how the hospital systems are all at a breaking point. No beds available, shortage of nursing staff, overworked staff, and the list went on and on. We've never seen anything like this before. We all have to pray and we all need to call upon God to deliver us. School is about to start and I know for a fact that some children are having a lot of anxieties about going back to school face to face because of the rising numbers of COVID cases. We've got to teach our children to pray when they go to school, to always practice safe measures. We've got to teach them to wear their masks. We've got to teach them to obey their teachers and always follow the rules. They've got to study hard and trust God for his protection. Because we learned that last year that we can't take school for granted. God is the only one who can keep them safe and keep us safe and bring us all through this year. God longs to make his will known to us. All we have to do is ask him for help. The song says, lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord.
thank you now, Lord. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege to come before you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for leading us, for guiding us. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us. God, we honor you for you are just good and you are God. Lord, thank you again, Father God, for giving us a privilege to come to you through prayer, through worship, through your word. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless your word. Forgive us for our sins that our sins, Father God, would not hinder our presence in your word, that our sins, Lord, would not hinder us from coming before you and hearing from you. Lord, we ask you to bless us now. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank God. Yes, Lord. Lord, let me walk. Amen. Bless the name of Jesus. We certainly want God to be the one that leads us. We want him to be the one who guides us. We thank God for the privilege of, of being led by him. Thank you for joining us here tonight for our Bible study. We're at the end of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, which means that we're at the end of 1 Thessalonians. And next week, we will look to go to 2 Thessalonians. So we're on our last pericope tonight in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to all the way to the end, which ends at verse 28. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 through 28 is where we are tonight. The Apostle Paul has given us a good dose of what the end times will look like. <laughs> he's talked to the church at Thessalonica. He's told them that the, there's a time that's coming that judgment will take place. He's also told them that the day of the Lord is coming also. That great day, many say that great getting up morning when Jesus will crack the sky. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who remain will be caught up with him in midair. He says that there's a difference in those two comings. Jesus Christ will first come, stop in midair, call the church unto himself. The dead in Christ, dead bodies will rise, and we will go on to be with the Lord. After the dead bodies have risen, then those of us who remain will be caught up with him in the midair. Let me just share with you, that's good news. <laughs> that is great news for it says, comfort one another with these things and we will forever be with the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb. He has talked to them over and over about, about these things that are coming up, false doctrines. He's talked to them about heresies. He's told them to endure he exhorted them to continue to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what the doctrine of Jesus Christ really means. So tonight he signs off. Tonight he gives his final greeting. Tonight he blesses them and he tells them, now may the grace of God, may the God of peace, may the God of peace, the God of rest. Verse 23. He says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May the God of peace, this God that puts us to rest, the God who gives us quietness, may the God of peace sanctify you. There's something about this God we serve. He is the Godhead. He is the divinity. He, he is the supreme divinity. He is the magistrate of all Christians. 
this God of peace is the one that we want to sanctify us. He says, may the God of peace, New King James says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. King James says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, I pray God your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body be preserved. Blameless unto the coming of all, of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at New King James and see how it says that. He says, now may the God of peace himself. King James says, the very God. New King James says, may the God of peace himself. King James declares the very same God. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and wholly. Let me just share with you. If you're going to be sanctified, if you're going to be set apart, if you're going to be different, it's going to take this God of peace, this, this supreme deity. It's going to take this exceeding God. It's going to take God himself, the great deity himself, to sanctify you. If you're going to be set apart, this word sanctify means to be set apart. It, it means to be different. It means to be rendered holy. The good thing here, you got to remember, it is to be rendered holy. To be rendered holy. Because we're not holy. You don't have a holy bone in your body. But God has rendered you holy. Let me just share with you, because of what Christ did on Calvary and how he got up that third day, we can consider ourselves holy. We can consider ourselves sanctified. We can consider ourselves uh, made holy by Jesus Christ. Now, I know, I, I, I realize that some people act like they're not holy. I realize that some people act like they're not holy at all. And therefore, Paul says tonight that you will be holy, holy. In other words, he says that you will be sanctified, be holy, H-O-L-Y, holy. And then he says, you're going to be sanctified in a holy way, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Fully, completely. This word complete means holy, means perfect. This word complete means in all manners of respect. So watch, watch the play on words here. You must understand it is this, this God of peace, the God of peace himself, no other God, but our great God can sanctify us, meaning that he can set us apart. He can make us H-O-L-Y, holy. Then he follows it up by saying, make you holy, you holy completely. And this word completely means holy. In the King James Version, it call it holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. So he wants to make you complete, makes you, make you completely holy. He wants to make you blameless. Now, because you're holy doesn't mean that you don't sin. <laughs> because you're holy and because you're completely holy doesn't mean that you don't fall short. Because all of us fall short. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 declares that all sin, all have sinned, and all fall short of God's glory. And because all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory, everybody has sinned. Every single person sins. Some sins are greater than others in the fact that they sin more often, but their sins are not blown up more than others. Sin, the, the thing that gets me is that people in the church, people in Christ think that they have arrived and they believe that these big old nasty, ugly black sins are overtaking our world. Let me just share with you, your sin, 
separate you from God, even if it's a bad attitude. And let me tell you, if you want to find some bad attitudes, go to the church house. There are some folk in the church house that can really show you what a bad attitude looks like. They can shut down and, and show you. They can speak up and show you. They can be indifferent and show you. Let me just share with you, whatever is not of God is sin. And we have labeled it where prostitutes are sinners, dope dealers are sinners, gamblers are sinners. But the fact of the matter is we all fall short. We all mess up. And then there is sin of omission, sin of commission. Sin of omission means that we didn't handle what we should have handled that God told us to handle. Sin of commission means that there's a sin and there's a group of sins that we automatically do. And we, we may come to the point in our life where we believe that even though we just automatically do it, it's not sin. What I'm saying to you is some people sin to the point where they look at sin and don't think it's sin anymore. I was listening to Don Lemon and he is, is one that believes that sin is not sin. You have to go listen to the broadcast yourself. But he believes that it's okay. He believes that God does not label any sin. And that God, and he actually says that the church folk need to go back and read their Bibles. Because the God we serve will not look down on anybody. And he's right. But he does distinguish what sin is. Don Lemon declares that the church folk need to get it right. He, in other words, he believed that he has it right. But sin has a way of separating us from God. It takes Jesus. It takes God. It says this very same God, who is the God of peace, this word peace means that he has set us straight. He has set us right. And Jesus did that on Calvary. So this same God that had his son killed, the same God who separated himself from sin by way of his only begotten, only unique son. This same God is the only God that can give you peace, quietness, truth, that can give you rest. And he says this same God is the same God who sanctifies us, who sets us apart, who makes us holy. He has deemed us. He has rendered us holy. But we're not holy. <laughs> it's just because Jesus Christ has paid the price for us. And when Jesus Christ paid the price for us, we accepted him as our savior. We are automatically deemed holy. We're automatically rendered holy. It is as if we had never sinned because when God looks at Jesus' blood, he can't see our sin. Now, that doesn't mean that you continue to sin, because as we see here, God has a way of sanctifying us. And he says in verse 23, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be, be, be preserved, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see... It takes the Holy Spirit to preserve us. It takes the Holy Spirit to commit us to being blameless. Now, just because you're blameless doesn't mean that you don't sin. It means that the fact of the matter is Jesus Christ will preserve us in such a way so that there is no cause for us to be censured, so that we will be considered faultless without blame. And the only way for us to be faultless is, and without blame is through Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit seals us. He preserves us. He, he, the Holy Spirit, he, not the Holy Spirit, it. The Holy Spirit, he, he seals us until the day of, of redemption. When I worked in the chemical plant, we would uh, load boxcars and we, we would load trailers on the rail track. And whenever we get through putting chlorine or acid or whatever the chemical was in that tanker, we would take a civil tag 
It was like a tie wrap, but it was silver in it, and it was made of metal. We would take this tie wrap, and we would crimp it down, crimp the nut down on it. And when we crimped that nut down on it, it was sealed until it got to where it was going. And no one was authorized to take that seal off of there except the man on the other end where when it got to the port it was going to. It was sealed. And if the seal was to be broken, the whole trailer, the whole tanker was deemed no good. Jesus Christ has saved us. Jesus Christ has blessed us. Jesus Christ has wiped our sins away. And because Jesus died and rose again for us, the Holy Spirit has sealed us until the day of redemption. And this seal will stay on us until Jesus cracks the sky. We, we are sealed. We, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit himself preserves us. And he preserves us and commit us to being blameless. And we are blameless. And, we, and, and because he has sealed us, because he preserves us, we will be blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it says in the text. And he leaves nothing about us unsaved. He says he's going to sanctify us completely and may your whole body, your whole spirit, your whole soul be preserved and committed to be blameless to the coming of Jesus Christ. You see, man has three different parts, three different makeups, his, his body, his soul, and his spirit. And the God we serve is such an awesome God, he preserves all of it. What a mighty God we serve. He preserves it all. He, he preserved us. Every person that is saved, every person that is born again has been preserved until the day of Jesus Christ. We have been sanctified, meaning we are set apart. We are different. We're not like the world. So we ought to stop acting like the world. Stop doing what the world does. We are set apart. We're different. Verse 24 says, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. He who has called you, he who, is call, who has called you, he alone is faithful. This word faithful means he's trustworthy. It means that you can believe in him. It means that it is for sure. As they would say back home, show sure enough for show sure enough. It is for sure. You can count on Jesus. You can count on the Holy Spirit. You can count on God the Father to preserve you. He says, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Nothing else can preserve you. There, there's some confusion about the upcoming Sunday school lesson, whether, whether he's talking about, when, when he's talking in, in Hebrews chapter 10, whether he's talking about losing your salvation or not. Let me just share with you. We're being preserved. We're being sealed. There's no way to lose it. God has preserved us. And not only that, he who has called us, he who has set us apart, he who has brought us out, he is faithful this word called means he has beckoned for us. He has bid it for us. He has called us. And not only that, he has named us. See, people think that God is calling people's number. God is not calling people by numbers. God knows our name. Yes. There was a lady who had 12 children. And a news reporter uh, interviewed her one day. And, and asked her, uh, how many children you have? And she said, there's Johnny, there's Jane, there's Mary. He said, no, no, no. I didn't ask you their names. I'm asking you how many. He said, she said, well, there's Johnny, there's James, there's Mary. He said, no, ma'am, I'm not asking you how many children you have. I'm asking you for the number of children you have. She said, I don't number my children. I give them names. I don't know them by number. I know them by name. 
Let me just share with you tonight. God knows our names. He has called us and he calls us by our names. And he, it doesn't matter if you have the same name as somebody else or not. Let me just share with you. God knows how to call you by your name. And when he calls you by your name, it doesn't matter who else has that same name. You respond to God based on your name. I've heard it said, and, and I believe it too, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, Lazarus, come forth. The Bible teaches that Lazarus got up. A dead man rose up. The good thing about it is uh, Jesus called him by his name. Had Jesus not called Lazarus by his name, I said, I believe it. I've heard it said it. If he had not called Lazarus by his name, if he had just said, come forth, arise, or get up, there would have been a general resurrection of the dead. But Jesus called him by his name. And look at what it says. He preserves our body, our spirit, and our soul. God knows your body, your spirit, and your soul. And it doesn't matter if you got the same name or not. God calls you by name, and he knows your body, your spirit, and your soul. God is calling people home, but he's not calling a number. Somebody said his number got punched. No, God didn't call him by number. He called him by name. It says here in verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. You can trust God. You can trust God to preserve you. You can trust God that he has called you. And you can trust God that he will preserve you. He will keep you. God has called us by our name. The word, the word call means he's beckoned for us and he has named us. He calls us by name. And the last part of that verse, it says, also he will do it. <laughs> what is he talking about? He will do. He will preserve us. Not only will he preserve us, he will call us. And when he calls us, he will call us by name. <laughs> It says God is faithful. In other words, God will always do what God says God will do. The problem I have with, with much of the theology these days is the fact that, that people saying that God is calling them, but they are not sticking with the word of God as God has called them. The God we serve is faithful. The God we serve is just. The God we serve changes not. Let me just share, share with you. He will do it. He's going to always be faithful. Yes. The problem is we're not faithful to God. God is faithful to us. Yes. We don't keep our word. God keeps his word. It says in verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Yes. God will do it. He will take care of it. And, and you, God has promised us that vengeance belongs to him. He will repay, says the Lord. And as he has, he has called us, we got to trust him. And we must trust the fact that the God we serve is the faithful God. God is faithful and he will never, ever, ever go back on his word. He's a faithful God. You can count on him. He will keep his promise. The problem is we're saying stuff that God didn't say. And we're trying to hold God accountable to what God never said. And just because God said it in some instance to some people doesn't mean that God is saying it to you. But one thing about God, God is faithful. How would it be if every person who is saved would just be faithful? If, just, if they would just be trustworthy, if they would just believe the God that we serve. You see, this, this word faithful is, is twofold. Number one, God is trustworthy. Number two, he is sure and he, you can trust him. Amen. And number three, you got to believe this. If the term is faithful, that means that we ought to believe him because he is faithful. God is faithful. Man is not faithful, but God is faithful. Too often people put their trust in man. Man will sell you out.
for a few dollars. Man will let you down. Man will mean well, but man will forget you. Ask Joseph. Joseph in the pit, brother said, hey, man, when I get out there, I'm going to remember you. He totally forgot about it. But God is faithful. The God we serve, he will do it. And not only is he faithful, he will preserve us to the day of redemption. God is faithful. Verse 25, he said, brethren, pray for us. Brethren, pray for us. Pray for us. You see, the apostle Paul valued prayer. He valued prayer so much until he oftentimes prayed for every church that he dealt with. He had spent many, many months praying for this church at Thessalonica. Not only did he value prayer in praying for them, he valued prayer in them praying for him. It, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a toll that is taken on a leader if you depend on the leader to do all your praying. If, if you depend on the leader to do all the praying, then when are you going to pray for the leader? The Apostle Paul makes it clear right here in verse 25, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25. He makes it very clear, and he says, brethren, pray for us. Now, he's not asking just anybody to pray. He says, brethren, these brethren are those who are saved, those who he talks to that have been called, those who have, have been ministered to, those who, who have trusted Jesus as their Savior. He says, since y'all are saved, since you believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, since you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, since you believe that God is faithful, I tell you what, pray for us. Yes. There are a lot of preachers who are ministering well, but they don't have enough prayer warriors praying for them. And let me tell you, the gift of prayer for your leaders and your preachers go a lot further than your dollar. Pray for us. Yes. This word prayer here in the original Greek text not only means that you have a dialogue with God where God talks to you and you talk to God. It also means to supplicate. Yes. This word supplicate means to, to pray with great vigor. It means to pray with enthusiasm. You must supplicate. You must call on God and, and you, must, you must intercede for somebody else. You must supplicate. You must supplicate. You, you got to call on. You can't just say, Lord, bless him and keep walking. You need to call on God. And when you call on God on behalf of your leaders and on behalf of your preachers and on behalf of your teachers, you need to supplicate. The second thing this word prayer means here, when he says pray for us, this word pray means to worship. It is worship. He says when you worship God, when you, when you come in contact with God, when you're praising God, when you're worshiping God, remember us in your worship. See, the problem with some people, when they go to church or when they hear a message or the, the choir is singing and everybody else is, uh, everybody else is responding, the reason why you can't respond is because you're not worshiping. Yeah. You know, the thing that's going around now, people leaving churches because they're not being fed but you didn't come to the table with an empty plate. And then when you came to the table, you didn't bring the right utensils. Mm -hmm. And when you came to the table, if you brought the right if you brought the right utensils and you brought a plate to be fed off, your attention strayed. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna be fed, at least give the man of God your attention. Yes, so, so he says, brethren, pray for us. And when, and when you pray, this, this word pray means to supplicate, means to, to call on God, sure enough. It means to call on God with great vigor, great, great, Lord, put yourself in the person's place that you're praying for. For whomever you're praying, put yourself in their place. If you were going through and how you would want somebody to pray for you, then you ought to be praying for that leader. Paul says, pray for us supplicate. And then he says, when you pray, your prayer ought to be one of worship. You ought to worship. 
there, there was a church setting, uh, revival going on, and there was a lady that was just sitting there. When the church stood up, she stayed sitting. When the church started praising, she just kept sitting. And when when the church when the church began to interact with the preacher, she just stayed there and didn't respond. So after church, the pastor asked her, "Sister, what, what's going on?" She said, "Well, I was worshiping all by myself. If you're going to worship in a public setting, you have to be a part of the worship setting." If you're going to worship, if you're going to be a part of a public setting, if God is going to use you in worship, you got to get it and be a part of worship. I used to, I used to play baseball, and even from little league all the way up, I, I would sometimes I would ride the pine. Sometimes I didn't get a chance to play the whole game because when you got good players and and everybody on the team is good, you don't have to put all 10, 12 people on, on, the, on the diamond, just keep them playing, just, just keep going. So sometimes I didn't get a chance to play. The reason I didn't get a chance to play is because they handled their business on the field. But I couldn't go home. I couldn't go home with a clean uniform on. I came out there to play. So I'd take me a running start. I would come out the dugout after the game is gone. I would come out the dugout, go straight down third base and run from third to, to home and slide in the dirt, get mud and dirt all over me. Because it wasn't enough for us to win a championship. It wasn't enough for us to win the game. And I didn't feel a part of it. At least with the same dirt that my, my teammates had on, I could feel a part. But when you in worship and when you in prayer, and everybody around you are worshiping and is, is worshiping and praying and, and talking to the Lord and, and talking back to the preacher and you don't get to be a part of it, it's because you have chosen not to worship. And when you're in a public setting, you ought to worship in that setting. Yes. Too many people are too quiet at church. They, they, they talk trash everywhere else, but when it comes to talking back to God, they're quiet and they, they, they pull out their personalities and say, well, you know, I, I don't know if it takes all that or not. I, I don't know. I, I just, I just, that's just not my personality. Well, if it's not your personality, that should not be one single thing that could move you out of your personality. If you can't worship God, I'm talking about the God who gives us breath, the God who makes us who we are, the God who causes our heart to beat. If you can't get excited about God, you ought not be excited about anything else. Shut it all down. You ought to be the quietest person everywhere you go. When you get with your girlfriends, when you get with the dudes, your dogs, you ought to be quiet. When the game is going on, you ought to be quiet. Because if you cannot get excited about this supernatural God, about this supreme deity, about worshiping him, you, got, you have some serious problems. Paul closes out this pericope. Verse 26, he says, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Now, this holy kiss in, in the modern-day vernacular would be a kiss on the cheek. But in our modern-day, what we do as a holy kiss, we shake hands. We, we shake hands to say that, that we are part of each other. And from a Christian vernacular, a holy kiss would be a peck on the cheek, not a, not a downright kiss. So what we have to remember that it's, it's for, for our day in the 21st century, it would be a shaking of the hand. But in the spiritual realm, the shaking of the hand means that you're my brother, you're my sister. That's why we teach at the, whole, at, at, at the New Beginning Church, we teach that, that the brothers have to look out for the sisters because you're looking out for your sister. And that's why sisters can't, can't lead brothers down the road because that's your brother. He says, greet all the brethren. There you go again, greet the Christians with a holy kiss. There's nothing foul about it. 
So what for today, we, we shake hands. And it means that we are on one accord. It means that we are spiritual enough. It's much more than just the shaking of a hand, but it signifies spiritual reconciliation. It's a signet of spiritual reconciliation. So my, my hand shake to you. And, and what the brothers do in church, they, they shake hands and, and hug each other around the back. It is what we know from the word as a holy kiss. Verse 27 says, I charge you by the Lord that you that that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. Here is Paul saying to us again that, that whatever you do, make sure that you pass this message along. The word epistle means message. He says, read this epistle to all the holy brethren. Even in Christianity, even in the church, some people can't handle everything. He emphasized the holy, all the holy brethren. Some people can handle this, and some people can handle this, and some people can handle a little nothing. You have to understand that the Apostle Paul is charging them. He's charging them from a, a standpoint to let them know that there are some brothers among you who are holy. And I'm telling you to, to make sure that you make a swear to me. When he charged them, he said, I want you to make sure that you commit to me that, that you will pass this letter along. Pass this message on. Let me tell you, we are called to pass on the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why if you ever, ever, ever hear a preacher at the New Beginning Church, he is always going to pass on the good news of Jesus Christ. If you ever hear a teacher at the New Beginning Church, he or she is going to always pass on the gospel message. The Apostle Paul says here, this gospel is so important. This message, this epistle is so important. I want everybody to hear it. Pass it on. It says, pass this epistle to all the holy brother. Finally, he says in verse number 28, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. You see, this word grace is what we're saved from. The word grace itself, it just simply gives us favor. He says, will the favor of Jesus Christ be with you? He says to us, be acceptable by the favor of Jesus Christ. You see, in other words, it is grace by which we are saved. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 declares to us, we are saved by grace. We're saved by unmerited favor. We are saved and it is not what we deserve. God has given us a gift and we ought to be thankful. It is God's great pleasure that we are now enduring. The, the songwriter says it's like this. It is the Lord's pleasure. It is the Lord's blessings that we are now enjoying. It is the Lord's love that we're now enjoying. It, it is the Lord's blessings. It is the Lord's grace that we're now enjoying. If you're listening to me tonight, you're only listening because of God's grace. It is God's amazing grace. I used to wonder back home how in the world that these people get happy every Sunday off the same song, and it was the same song. They knew it was coming. They, they knew we were going to sing it right before the preaching. But the same song over and over and over again was God's amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. I could time it when they were going to get shouted. Now I understand. It's God's grace. And God's grace makes you shout. God's grace makes you tear up. God's grace. When I think about the goodness of God and all he's done for me, I just get happy. 
I celebrate. Paul says to them tonight, the grace, the pleasure, the favor, the joy of the Lord, Jesus Christ, God's son be with you. Amen. It is so. Amen. It is real. Amen. It has been said. Amen. You're telling the truth. Somebody here tonight has not trusted God's grace. I recommend that you do. Look at what it says. It says the grace of our Lord, it only comes through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. It says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God has given us another chance. He has given us an opportunity to get it right. And we can't get it right without Jesus. Yes, Though the church is open, the invitation is extended. If you never confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity. You ought to get to know him. The door is open. All you have to do is believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the Son of God, died on a skull hill called Calvary. He died for you and he died for me. He was an innocent man. He had no sin. But an innocent man died for the guilty. Jesus paid the price for you through his death. But early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. If you can just believe this story, that mean men killed him. They robbed him of his life. If you can believe the story that they laid Jesus after he was dead in a borrowed tomb. If you can believe that early that third day morning Jesus rose from the dead. You can be saved today. You can guarantee yourself a spot in heaven today. Will you join me and invite Jesus into your life by just trusting the story of his death, burial, and resurrection? Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed this prayer, you're now born again. We believe that when you die, you will go to heaven. There are others of us that, that Paul talks about as he closes out this prayer this book of 1 Thessalonians as he closes out chapter 5 as he closes out this final pericope in 1 Thessalonians he identifies us as the sanctified if you're not sanctified if you're one who have, have been saved and know that you are but for some reason or the other you struggle with sin like others do like all others do I want to pray with you Father God, we thank you for those who will admit and confess that they've fallen short, they've messed up, they, they are sinful. I ask you to forgive them, forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, to be about your business. Bless us, Lord, to repent and to turn around. Bless us, Father God in heaven, that we will walk with you and that we will cherish the moments of sanctification that we, Lord, will look to be more like Jesus. Give us the strength. Give us the power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God.
Thank you so much for listening to our Bible study on tonight. Thank you for being a part of it. Now it is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want this ministry to continue to come into your home and continue to be a part of the Houston area and all over the world, you can give tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. First of all, you can give by mailing it to our P.O. Box. Our P.O. Box is 503 Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can send your tithes, offering, sacrificial giving into Zale. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. You can send to Zelle or you can send to the P.O. Box. Again, the P.O. Box is 503 Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Thank you so much for being a part of our Bible study. Thank you so much for your contributions. For those who have been contributing all this time, thank you so much for being, being kind and being obedient to the Lord. And we want to make sure that we continue to be a blessing to the Lord's ministry. I want to continue to ask for prayer for Miss Ramona Mathis and the Davis family. This is Sister Nicole Davis' mom, Miss Ramona Mathis. We're lifting her up in prayer that God will continue to bless and heal. We're lifting up Sister Lula Richard. We're lifting up Sister Lula Richard or Richard as and in these bereaved moments. As we know, Reverend J.R. Richard has gone on to be with the Lord. We're also look, lifting up Eloise Johnson and the death of her husband, Brother Walter Johnson, has gone on to be with the Lord. We're also look to, lifting up Pastor and Sister Aaron, Pastor Alan Aaron and Sister Deborah Aaron. We're lifting them that God will continue to heal and strengthen their body. We want to make sure that we continue to lift these before the Lord. The funeral service of uh, Minister Reverend J.R. Richard is at the Fountain of Praise this Saturday. Uh, the viewing starts at 11 a.m. and the service starts at 12 a.m. at the Fountain of Praise here in Houston. Uh, funeral service for Reverend J.R. J.R. Richard. We're praying for those names who we've called here tonight and any other names. Also, we're praying for the Dixon family, the Irving family, the Dixon family, the Wade family. We're praying our sister Van Irving and, and brother Dixon are members of the New Beginning Church. We're praying for them in, the, in these moments of bereavement as their brother has passed to be with the Lord. Amen. So let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us. We come before you in times like these, Father God, for we know that you are the great God. You're the great King. You are the healer. And you are the comforter. Lord, we pray for these who, whose name we've called. We ask you to give them comfort, to heal their bodies. Bless them during these times of bereavement. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to be God in their midst. We pray, Father God, that you touch as only you can. Strengthen these families, strengthen these bodies, and strengthen our church. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us on tonight. We ask you to continue to walk with us and bless us that we will represent you well, Lord, and that we will not make you ashamed. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and honor. Until we meet again, let us say together, amen, amen, amen. 
Here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.